Well, if you're glad you're here this morning, glad you're saved, let's hear a big amen. That's good. That's real good. I think, I guess this church got about the best congregational singing of any church I've ever been to. And especially for a Sunday morning. You know, usually, uh, usually it takes Sunday morning service to get the devil out of you. And then you're ready to have church on Sunday night. Of course, I don't know how you are on a regular Sunday morning. We've been having church since Thursday, so I hope uh, maybe maybe you are dead on a regular Sunday morning. I don't know, but I I hope that you're not. Now I th- I think you ought to try to go with the flow of the service this morning, and so I, I wouldn't want to maybe try to make it take a different direction or anything. So I want to add along with the other testimonies. Uh, uh, I had the worst year of my life in 1988, <laughs> and um, you know it's amazing. I wonder how many, how many, anybody else have that same testimony? I think Unleashed Hell came out in 1988. Really, I do. I never seen such a time in my life. I didn't preach New Year's Day because Brother Danny Chapel's with us for the weekend. And he preached. And I didn't get to have a New Year's sermon. But if I had preached a New Year's sermon, I'd done had my title and everything. My title was going to be, Thank God 1988's over. <laughs> and we're liable to see some rough sailing from here on in. And I don't know what you're going to expect. I don't know what's going to happen before the Lord comes. I hope He comes real, real soon. But if He don't, man, you better buckle your seatbelt and settle down for the long haul. Pull your cap down over your ears and get you a good deep breath. Plant your feet on the ground and expect anything. But God's fair. He don't. You don't. You never get cheated living for the Lord. Where where the devil hits you in one place, God will make it up to you somewhere else. The Lord ain't. He's not gonna rip you off. We've uh, we've had a wonderful year last year, and our church grew, and we averaged more in church and Sunday school than we ever have before, and. Uh, had more people saved than we never had before, just right on along. I, I was telling this morning, I'd get up on Sunday morning sometimes and didn't know which way was up. Didn't have a thought, couldn't even keep my mind straight and try to preach and a 50-year-old man get out and come down to the altar and get saved. So we've been praying for for a long time and it's just amazing. The Lord does stuff like that to just keep it in your mind that it's Him doing the work and not you. Just in case you ever want to get the big head, you know, the Lord will knock you down uh, enough to let you know that you're nothing. He's everything. And He can do what He wills. And He can open the door and nobody can shut it. And when He shuts one, there ain't no use trying to open it. And you're wasting your time. I tell you, uh, Brother Cargill got plugged in last night. And I was, I was uh, really enjoying that. I didn't thank God for the young man that was saved last night. I didn't know it till at the end of the service. I had a young boy saved here last night, and we praise the Lord for that. And I want you to turn your Bible this morning to John chapter 15. Uh, now, I reckon you'll be here tonight in the service, bring somebody with you. Surely, 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 after having services for four days, Nobody here is backslid enough. Surely not. Not in this great church. I, I shouldn't even think of stuff like that. Surely. Just maybe there's a visitor here that might think like that. Nobody would lay out of the house of God this evening, would they? My, my. I mean, I know Charles Manson is bad. If you think about the Lord blessing you and pouring out His Spirit on you and you staying out of church tonight, oh my soul, surely you wouldn't do that. I didn't think you would. Some of you guys got a funny look on your face. You've already got it planned in your mind to lay out and watch the Super Bowl. Now what you do, you get down this evening and you ask the Lord which one He wants you to do. I was in a church preaching up in Michigan, and boy, I got—I was talking about them old nasty shows that a lot of people watch. And I said, "Man, you ought not to watch them old nasty shows like Dallas and Die Nasty." 
And I said, you shouldn't watch. And this one fella, he, he didn't like what I said about Dallas and, and or Dynasty. And he, I was over at his house the next day and went in there to eat. And he said, how you like that? And he had a television, a screen, man, as big as that curtain right there. He said, what do you think about that? And I said, well, that's nice, but how many cars do you think you can park in here? <laughs> and he didn't think that was a bit funny. He said, that cost $3,000. I said, well, that's, that's all right me. I don't care. Uh, uh, if that's, you know, but there's really that not, not much, a whole lot you can watch, you know, these days. It's fit to watch. And if you will spend $3,000, that's your business. I couldn't care less. And he said, but I like some of the shows that you don't like. I said, no, I don't remember getting up here and telling him what shows I like and what shows I do. I don't even remember think, saying that. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, like Dallas and stuff like that. And I said, wait a minute. I didn't say I didn't like it. I said it wasn't right. Amen. The question ain't what do you like and what you don't like. Who cares what you like? If, I'm, if all I'm doing up here on Sunday morning is telling you what I like and what I don't like, you're wasting your time listening to me. We're here to find out what God says is right and wrong, man. It don't make a big flip what you think is right or wrong or what you like. It's what God says, see? Your opinion don't matter. And mine don't either. And he said, well, I like you don't like. I said, wait a minute, I didn't say I didn't like it. I mean, I don't, but I didn't say that. What I said, it's not right for you to watch people take their clothes off and cuss and crawl in bed together. And I said, you know, that ain't, that ain't right. That couldn't be right. There ain't no way it could be right. Could it? All of you that didn't say no, you know I'm right, but... You want to do it so you know if you said it's wrong, you wouldn't feel right about doing it no more and you're trying to justify yourself. Now, that ain't what I'm preaching on this morning, but anyway, uh, I, I, had, uh, I, I had dinner with him that day and then so Friday night came. Friday night's the night of his favorite show. He said he never misses it. Friday night came and Lord, I come in the church and he sat down back there and I thought, Hallelujah! God has moved! Revival has come! To Flint, Michigan, sure as well. There's a brother that sacrificed J.R. and Sue Ellen on Friday night to come to the house of God. Hey man, you know you're in the last days when a Christian gives up a dirty program to come to church. Boy, that's revival, man. That's the nearest thing to a move of God we got in this nation. I thought, hallelujah, praise God, the Lord has used me. Amen, thank you, Lord. Boy, I've got that dirt out of that fella's heart. I'm feeling real good, you know, amen, glory to God. Got a good lick in up here for the Lord and get these people's life. Maybe they get cleaned up, you know, the Lord start using them and stuff. Well, we went over there to eat pizza after church. And a little girl come in and let the cat out of the bag. I was sitting there enjoying the pizza, you know, and everything. She come running down and she said, Daddy, guess what? The VCR didn't go off and, and you missed Dallas. I thought, well, that's sorry, bum, man. He had that thing set in time so he'd come on and tape it. So he could watch it when he gets home. Now, if you want to do that Super Bowl, okay. But don't lay out of church. Amen? I don't believe that'd be right. I don't believe that'd be right at all. All these guys talking about uh, what, what the brother said about that book. Doesn't matter who wrote it, that's the truth. The question is not who is right. We got young preachers up in North Carolina saying they're, they're, there's about five different sets of independent Baptists. So, you know, there's the Sammy Allen crowd, and then there's the Sword of the Lord crowd, and then there's the Dr. Seitler crowd, and then there's the, uh, the other crowd, Mount North Missouri, there ain't many of them around where we live. And there's the other crowd, there's about four different sets, and they all say, Brother so and so says this, and then there's, uh, some say Brother Ruckman said this and that. The question is not who is right. The question is what is right. The question has never been who is right. The question has always been, what is right? And if you stick with what is right, you won't have to worry about getting off track or following a man the wrong way. Nothing wrong with following a man if he's going in the right direction. 
It's always wrong to follow a man if he's going in the wrong direction. Your job is check him out by the book and see if he's going in the right direction. And you're obligated to do what's right if he is. John chapter 15. I want to read you some scripture here this morning. And we'll hurry right along. I know this is bound to be one of them churches where you get out at 12 on the dot, so that leaves me seven minutes. And you shouldn't have sung half a day. John chapter number 15. And I'll read you a quick verse of Scripture here that most of you know. John 15, 19. John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. That's the truth, ain't it? But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. I'll preach to you a few minutes on why the world hates a Christian. The world, just as the Savior said, has a kind of hatred for Christian. Partly because of the claims of Christianity are so great, it bothers the world that Christians boast in the things that the world is really looking for and can't find and we claim to have them and have given up the world. It blows their mind. They can't figure us out. Here they're out here searching for peace and happiness and fun and all of that and can't find it. We gave up the whole world and have peace, happiness, joy and fun. And they say, I can't stand that bunch of people. We turn their stomach. Uh, uh, a shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. And did you know, they, we stink. In their, uh, they hate us. Don't think it's strange if the world hates you. The, the world uh, has things to offer and they think it will make them happy. And we give them up and get happy and don't have what they're trying to find to make them happy. And they're jealous of us for being happy, not even hunting the same things they're hunting to make them happy. You better got that the first time because I couldn't say it again. <laughs> it creates a jealous hatred in the eyes of the world for Christians. I'm going to give you three or four things this morning of why the world hates a Christian. I bet it flipped your brain when you got saved and you went, got real happy and you went back home and you just couldn't wait to tell all your family and friends, Woo! Praise God! The Lord has done something for me! And you thought they'd pat you on the back and brag on you and tell you what a fine fellow you are and say, Oh, isn't it wonderful? Little Johnny has gotten saved. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Susie has turned her life over to the Lord. And they looked at you like you got AIDS. They backed off of you and they, they began to disown you. They wouldn't even invite you when they was having something. Their family, they give you the cold shoulder and literally begin to hate you. Some of your own family will despise you in their heart when you get right with the Lord. I want to tell you why this morning. Number one, the world hates a Christian because a Christian is one who believes the unbelievable. We can believe something that is unbelievable to the world. Matter of fact, you become a Christian by believing something that is unbelievable. You know what you believe? You believe that a virgin had a baby and had never known a man by lying with him. And a virgin had a baby and to beat it all, that baby was God that made the world in human flesh. That's unbelievable, man. How many of you believe that though, Ray? Yeah. You're crazy in the eyes of the world. I believe it, don't you? Somebody said, well, it's just not possible. They said, it's not right. I just can't believe the fact that Jesus Christ got here and had no earthly father. I said, man, that ain't nothing. Adam and Eve got here and didn't have a mama or a daddy. What do you think about that? You think the virgin birth's a miracle? Hey, man, Adam and Eve didn't even have a belly button. I'm telling you today, listen, brother, God let Adam and Eve get here without the the aid of an earthly father or a mother. And so we believe the unbelievable. He was God in the flesh. He lived 33 years and never stepped one step that far out of God's will. There was not one word come out of His mouth that wasn't supposed to come out. There was not one thing He did and not one thing He left undone. You believe that? That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. But we believe it. And we believe they had a vicarious and substitutionary death. We believe that they took a Jew outside of Jerusalem and they put him up on a big old hill and they put nails in his hands. And we believe when that blood ran out of that Jew's hands, that 
faith in that blood in 1988 can make a harlot pure and make a drunkard clean. That's unbelievable, man. You think of all the Jews that died back in them days and shed blood. Why that one? We believe the unbelievable. We believe some wild stuff, buddy. When you really start thinking about it, have you ever thought about all the crazy stuff you and I believe? And it's true. It's true, thank God. It's true. We believe in the resurrection from the dead. Scientists say that's impossible. Oh, you don't know it's not. That's unbelievable. It might be to you, but it's not to us. We believe the unbelievable. We believe in the authority of Scripture. We believe there's a book, and that book is perfect, and that book has the words of God in that book. We don't believe it contains a message. We don't believe it contains spiritual literature that you can apply to your life and find God in. We believe that book contains and is the very Word of God. We believe that book was preserved and God got us a Bible we can depend on. Somebody said, boy, you sure got a lot of faith in them King James translators. I ain't got a lick of faith in them. I don't even know if they say them. Don't, don't, don't. I hope they went to heaven, but I don't care how they live. That's their business. And my faith is that God got me a book that I believe in. And I believe He did. We believe the unbelievable. We believe in the second coming. We believe that one of these days, you and I are going to fly without wings. Have you ever dreamed that you could fly? I've had several dreams that I could fly. And not long ago, I was, I was dreaming, and I was out in my front yard. And all of a sudden, I could just go... And I was going over the trees and the mountains, you know. I wasn't on nothing neither. I, I was dreaming. And buddy, I'll tell you, I was going over the hills and the mountains. Man, that felt so good. I was, if you had wings, had wings. And boy, I was thinking going down through there and I could go over the mountains and the trees like this. I thought, boy, what a feeling. And all them old Wright brothers up there, Kitty Hawk, you know, they got them things are going. And they, they kept, you ever seen them old film clips of them first airplanes, you know. Uh, and it plays that real fast banjo music music behind it and they go down there real fast like it, or they go about 20 foot off the ground like that they tried that for years and years and years and now they got jets and they can go up 30 or 40 thousand feet and they think that's hot stuff you know what me and you believe we believe we're going to fly one of these days we're going to go up through the sky past the clouds past the sun the moon the stars we believe the unbelievable man that is unbelievable did you know what the hope of the world is this morning the best the world has to offer this morning. All young people listening, if you don't accept what we've got for you this morning, here's the next best thing you've got. That man is going to continue to learn and evolve and populate outer space. Which means none of y'all in here got to hope because they ain't going to do it in your lifetime. They say this world's polluted and our air's running out and our water's getting dirty and there's trash all over the place and there's disease. We're going to have to somehow move on to the planets. And somebody comes along and says, now you know good and well you can't move up out of the planets. And they say, that's the same thing they told them in the old world before Christopher Columbus come over here. They said there wasn't no way to get over there. And look how he... But listen, man. Living on the moon is a little bit different than Columbus coming across the ocean. I mean, that's a little bit of a different ball game. There is air here that they could breathe when they got here. What are you going to breathe when you move to the moon? Going to build you a big old babble up there and pump air from down here up there? What are we going to breathe if you pump all air up there? What are you going to eat, man? Rocks? People's crazy thing. You know what they're doing now? There's an organization that is offering for fifty thousand dollars. The second you die, we'll transport your body to the hospital and quick freeze you. And they're gonna put you in this capsule and shoot you into outer space, and you're gonna circle the earth for 30, 20 or 30 years until they find out a cure for whatever killed you and they can pick you a new heart and get you ticking again and then they're going to bring you back down here and thaw you out and fix you up and you'll get to live sometime 19, I mean in the year 2020 or something like that. 
and they're all sold out right now. Fifty thousand dollars a whack. And don't you come in here looking at us like we ain't got no sense. You talk about a fool, buddy. For the first thing, I wouldn't give them fifty thousand dollars for. How? Hey, listen. How do you know they'd ever find out what what killed you and how to fix it? And second, if they did, how do you know they wouldn't just leave you up there floating around? They'd say, oh, he'll never know the difference. Leave him up there and keep that $50,000. Can you imagine people sinking 50000 bucks in that kind of hope that is so unsettled and unsure? You know why they hate us? You know why the scientists and philosophers and historians and educators hate us this morning? Because here we are, a bunch of no good nobodies, and don't have any money, and don't have much prestige or reputation, and we're sitting here and saying, we're going to fly away one of these days and live forever in a perfect city. And they say, oh, I can't stand them people. Oh, they make me sick. That's why they hate us this morning. We believe the unbelievable. But second, let me say this this morning, a Christian is one who knows the unknowable. Do you know that? We know things they can't know. And it irritates a fire out of them. Because in our society of education worship, it, it just kills people to think that you, uneducated, can know something that they don't know being educated. I mean, they really take offense at that. But I'm telling you this morning, we know some unknowable things. We know some things beyond the bounds of man's limited knowledge. Let me give you some examples. We know where the world come from. I know how the world got here. You say, well, Brother Danny, I go over here to university, and they get up and they say, scientists are still trying to figure out. That's their problem, man. I know where it come from. I know where one, of these, one day, God was up there in heaven. And the Lord looked down, and He said, well, I believe it's about time for me to begin to create. And the Lord looked down there, and He said, let there be, and there was. It didn't take it, it didn't take it a hundred thousand years to happen. As soon as He spoke it, whatever He said was done, and God looked down and said, it is good. He made the world. He, he spoke the sun. He said, let there be a sun. Bam! Let there be a moon. Bam! And he went, bling, like this, and flung out ten billion stars out all over space. And he made space to put the stars in. Before God made space, there wasn't no space. You say, what was that? There wasn't nothing. You say, well, what's a nothing? It wasn't, they, well, what, there wasn't no nothing to be a nothing. There couldn't even be a nothing until God made a nothing to put space in. Man asked me, he said, where'd God come from? Well, he didn't come from nowhere. What are you talking about, man? He made everything if they wouldn't know where for him to come from. He, he made it all. You say, oh, you don't really believe that. Well, let me ask you something, smarty pants. Where did it come from? He said, well, many, many, many billions of years ago, as we study geology and, and, and rocks straight on, we find there was a huge explosion on the sun. After this huge explosion on the sun, a blob of mass whirled around. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Come on. Where did the sun come from? Yeah. Well, it was a big boom. Who made that big boom? Amen. What did that big boom boom? Where'd that stuff come from that boomed? Smarty pants? Well, where did it come from? You say, well, it always has been. Well, if it always has been, how did it get there? I know. Teacher, can I answer that question? God made it. You say, well, that's your theory. No, I know that. I know. You just think you know it. No. We know that we know it. You know what's the matter these people? They think because they don't know it that nobody else can't know it. You know what the problem is? They're struck on their self. They think they are so smart that nobody could possibly know anything they don't know. And it's just because they think, well, we don't know that. They say, you couldn't know that. You're not as smart as I am. Well, listen, buddy. Just because you're smart don't mean you got any sense. And just because you're educated don't mean you got good sense. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. You can store up a bunch of facts. I know some people that's been to college that ain't as dumb as a doorknob. 
I meet them in banks and stuff. I'm crazy, girls. I've done got my receipt figured out in my head and how much I owe them, how much they owe me, and what my balance is. And they're over here pushing buttons. Going, did it, did it, did it, did it. It seemed like I said, oh, you owe me ten dollars. Well, Mr. Castle, I'm there, and I said, listen, girl, think. That head, your head, you've got a head. Think. And they ain't got a lick of sense. And then the school. What the problem is, they don't like us because we know the unknowable. You know where the world come from? God made it. You know why there's retarded people in the world and people born handicapped? The world don't know. I know, don't you? The world's under a curse because of sin. You say, if there's a God, why did He let... Listen, buddy, we're under a curse! I know why there's retarded children. I know why there's war. I know why there's people born without arms and legs and people live in a hospital half of their life. I know why. Do you know it? It ain't my fault. You can find it out here this morning. We know the unknowable. Hey, I'll tell you one. You think this is no, no you think that's something about knowing the unknowable? We even know where we're going to go when we die. Now put that in your pipe and smoke it. Well, them crazy Christians, they don't sound too crazy to me. I don't know anybody else in the world knows where they're going when they die. I see them little tabloids down there at the store, and them grocery store down there, and it said, Amazing discovery! Scientists finally prove that there's life beyond the grave. And I start laughing and say, Finally prove? People, they knew that for 5,000 years, man. Job knew that, that he would see his Redeemer and his Redeemer live and that in his flesh he would see God and be on the grave. They knew that back in the Old Testament. Our problem is, brother, they hate us because we can know the unknowable. Now old Ronald Reagan gets up there and he's gone out. And Mr. Bush gets up there and he's coming in. And they're going to meet with Gorbachev and this and that. And, and they're going to have a big meeting of all around the world. And they're going to discuss the future of our planet. And they're going to try to bring everybody together and saying what's going to come in the future. Now, you know what they can do? They can take an old hick from the middle of nowhere and take him up there and say, this old boy right here is going to tell you the future of the world. I know the future of the world. You say, boy, you, you, you sure are conceited. No, I'd be lying if I said that I didn't know. I do know. You want me to tell you? Okay. You know what's going to happen? Things are going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. And I'd like for old Ted Couple to come and sit down right there and old Walter Concrete and Dan Rather and every one of them fellas and set them down right here and say, listen, boys, here's the way it's going to be. Things are going to get worse and worse. People's going to keep getting raped and people are going to keep selling drugs and there's more kids going to commit suicide and the drug problem ain't over and the sexual revolution is not curbed and being slowed down. It's getting worse and worse and worse. People's going to keep blowing each other's heads off. Stores are going to get broke into. People's going to be mobbed, have their head beat in. They're going to keep throwing them bottles like they're doing down there in Miami the other day. That stuff's going to keep going on and on and on and on. One bright morning, there's going to be a great big sound like a thunderclap. And it's going to be like a sonic boom. And it's going to be the voice of the Lord. And to the well, it's just going to be a big old boom like that. And you, it's going to sound like this. Come up hither. And brother, we're going to go up to meet the Lord and go up there in the sky. And while we're up there, the Lord's going to put us on the ironing board. And while we're getting the wrinkles ironed out of our wedding garment at the judgment seat of Christ, all hell's going to break loose down here. There's going to be a man step out on the scene and he's going to say, peace, peace, peace. Here I am and I've come to solve the world's problem. And there's going to be a big war there and that fellow's going to promise him a false peace. And that false peace is going to last for three and one half years. In the middle of that three and one half years, he gets a big head and goes into the temple and sits down and says, I'm God. And from now on, I'm running the show. And those Jews are going to say, oh, no, you ain't God because it ain't right for us to put marks on our hand. And he said, you're going to put your hand mark on that hand or on that forehead or you ain't going to buy nothing. Now, you hear me this morning? There's people sitting in here. There's some of you young men sitting here this morning. One of these days, you're going to let them put a mark on your hand or on your forehead to buy your groceries, to get your driver's license just as sure as you live because you're not saved and you ain't going up when we go. That's
That's your future, buddy. You're going to worship a devil. After that goes on, boy, those Jews are going to head out of the country. And they're going to have their heads cut off. And they're going to go out there to that big old city. And God's going to surround them with them walls. And the Lord's going to drop manna out of the sky for three and a half years. And the water's going to turn to blood. Water right here in Pensacola. They'll go turn the spigot on. And boy, if God don't let the United States get blown off the map, wherever you are living, there'll be water coming in your bathtub like blood. And it will be blood. And the next thing you know, the sun will get so hot that it'll scorch people. And people will be a-dying like flies. And one-fourth of the population, over a billion people, will die in those plagues. And great big hailstones, big as that organ, will come falling out of the sky and busting buildings and smashing cars. And the wrath of God will be poured out on this earth. And brother, the next thing you know, it'll get worse and worse. And pestilences and famines and perils, just like it did back in the book of Exodus on Egypt. And the next thing you know, at the end of that time, there's going to be a big sound. Those guys are going to be gathered together over there in the valley of Megiddo. And they're going to be ready to fight that big battle. And that Euphrates River has dried up. And they come down that down through there. And the next thing you know, there's going to be a sign open up in heaven. And a door come back. And a big old white horse come out of that sky. And a bunch of other people on white horses right behind it. That's me and you. And buddy, here we go, man. Here we go. Let's go. High old silver. That's what made one old preacher say, I'm going to leave here like Superman and come back like a long ranger. Amen. I'm telling you this morning, brother, we're coming back behind him. And he's going to come down there and somebody's going to say, Whose side are you on? And he's going to say, I didn't come to take sides. I come to take over. And brother, they're going to move him back aside. The horse blood's going to run up to the horse's bridle for that long all those miles and the Lord's going to sit down on the throne in Jerusalem. You still with me? We'll have a commercial right here. After this, we'll tell you the next 1,000 years of human history. Which kind of toothpaste do you use? Before I started wearing my Air Jordans, I was a 10 point a game man. But after I went down and paid $100 for my Air Jordan, I averaged 20 points a game now. Yes, Air Jordan, the choice of the pros. We're back now, live. And buddy, I'll tell you what's going to happen after that. The Lord's going to sit down on the throne and He's going to say, all right, straighten up around here. Where's my rod? Where's my rod of iron? Oh, I went my microphone. Where's my rod of iron? Yes, sir, here's my trusty rod. Now, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to whack you over the head with this rod of iron. And He's going to rule with a rod of iron. Whack is a, is a Greek term that you first year students might not know. Which means... Uh, conk in, in Greek <laughs> means bust in English. I'll whack you over the head with this rod of iron. And boy, I tell you, they're going to say, yes, sir. And we're going to rule and reign with him 1,000 years. During this 1,000 years, the devil will be sent to the chain game. Where the big angel will come and wrap a chain around him and bind him for 1,000 years. As soon as that 1,000 years is over, he's going to get out. During that time, all kinds of good things are going to happen. The death is going to bloom like a rose. And little kids play with rattlesnakes. And if somebody dies 100 years old, they'll think, ain't that pitiful, that poor little young and dying like that. 100 years old. And buddy, all kinds of neat things. And we'll be traveling around. We'll have our glorified bodies, see. Them people, them people have them normal bodies that got saved through the tribulation. Come through there. They have normal bodies. I mean, you can just zip, 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 zip. I go up there and I say, I say, Mars. Doo. And I'm in Mars. And I'll say, I'm going to zip over there. You know why the Lord made all them planets? He got plans for them planets. And no telling what he's going to do. You read Isaiah 66, didn't you? Where it said of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. That thing keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. 
God's big enough to do something like that. And boy, well anyway, all that stuff keeps going on and keeps going on and keeps going on and then we're going to have that big war there at the end. Judgment Day finally comes. Great white throne. You'll stand before God. If you're here this morning you're not saved, you'll stand and give an account of your life. God's going to open up those books. He's going to tell everybody what you've done, where you was at last night, every place you've ever been. God's going to read it out and they're going to big angel's going to pick you up and throw you in a lake of fire and you're going to burn and scream and beg God for a drop of water on your tongue. That's the future of the world. Big city come down out of there and they'll say, here comes a bride. We'll move in in our new home after a thousand year honeymoon. Live there forever with our Savior in our new house. Forever and ever and ever and ever. You know, the world don't like us because we know all that stuff. Well, you just don't know. Oh, yes, we do, too. We got a book that ain't never been proved wrong yet. He ain't missed a lick, man, in 6,000 years. Why would he start messing up now? You know, you've got a problem if you don't believe the Bible. And your problem is this, Mr. Atheist. If you're so smart and the Bible ain't true, tell me why everything is turning out right now like that book said it would 2,000 years ago. Let's hear it. The Lord said, as it was in the days of Lot. Do you know when Lot lived? He lived back in Genesis, man. Them people were like dogs. You wouldn't think you'd get like that in 20th century America, would you? Where people's educated and refined and cultured. Why, the chances of that happen? If I'd have been back there prophesying, I'd have said people's going to advance. They'll never live like that again. But they are. Boy, when the Lord says something, you might as well just park your car. Drive the nail in the wall, buddy. It's as good as done. The Lord said, as it was in the days of Noah, eating, drinking. Marrying, giving in marriage. My soul, folks, are you deaf? Are you blind? They will say, give me a sign. That is a sign. The Lord said that it would be happening, and it is happening. Well, we got homosexual churches. Preachers. One got up and said, the flowers this morning were donated by Steve and Bill. <laughs> really? Remembering their first anniversary. And there's Steve and Bill back there. My soul! God didn't make Adam and Steve. Did he? Amen, brother. God said that it would be that way in the last days. But we know the unknowable. Not only that, let me say number three. I'm going to have to hurry right quick. A Christian is one who can do the impossible. We can do stuff the world can't do. God's people have always been do things. They don't ever do things the world can do. Back there when they went across the Red Sea, the world tried it and look what happened to them. Back when Daniel laid in the lion's den, the world tried it and look what happened to them. Heat the furnace hot enough, kill them fellows that throwed Shadrach them in there and they're in there walking around in an air-conditioned room. We're going places they can't go. We're doing things they can't do and they're just so jealous of us they can't stand it. But what the poor nuts don't know is they can have it too if they'd surrender. All you got to do is just give in and forget your pride and humble yourself and say, okay, I'm wrong, I'm no good, I deserve to go to hell. But you're too caught and picking stubborn to do that, ain't you? You're going to figure it out your way, right? Come back and see me in about 50 years and I'll see if you've made any advances. Unless you're up there floating around in one of them capsules. I'll wave at you when we go by. Hey, we can overcome sin. You know what the world says? Man that's an alcoholic's got a disease and he's got an incurable disease. That's a lie out of hell. That's a lie, brother. Don't you tell me it's incurable. I'd show you a bunch of people that ain't drunk a drop since God saved them or they got right with the Lord or like in Brother Cargill's place since they were sanctified. But God still done it anyway, right? I mean, He done it. He can do it. It, it don't matter when He does it as long as He gets it done in your life. And we can do the impossible. We can overcome sin. We can love the unlovable. We can care about people that the world says they're no good. We don't want them. God God enables us to do something the world can't do. When I think of God's people, 
I think about old Harlan Popoff, who I understand just went home to be the Lord not long ago. And I think about him. You remember the volume on this one, brother? Standing there at that white wall for two solid weeks and slapping him every time he gets ready to fall down. I tell you what, that a man that can do that, he's getting some help from somewhere. He can do the impossible. Christians have faced unreal opposition. It blows the world's mind when they see us go through troubles and just keep right on going like nothing ever happened. They say, I can't figure that out. We can do the impossible. We're supermen. <laughs> because, because of the Lord. I mean, it ain't nothing we can do. We're just sorry and weak as anybody else. But it's, it's kind of like God carries you. See? He just picks you up. It's amazing that the Christian can do... Listen, if you do the best you can, God can bring you through any circumstance. Do your best. God will do the rest. Or that teacher talked to them little kids one morning and she said, now you're going to illustrate me a Bible truth. She said, illustrate this truth with a story. And you got to bring something to illustrate it. So one little fellow came in and he said he brought him a little candle. He lit it and said, here's my verse. She said, quote it. Ye are the light of the world. Very good, son. Next little fellow came up, had him a salt shaker. Poured out some salt. Quote the verse. Ye are the salt of the earth. Very good, son. Next little fellow came up, had a little bitty banny egg. He held that little baby egg on his hand. She said, what does this represent? He said, that verse that says, she hath done what she could. Amen. You, may, you may feel like just a little baby chicken. You may feel like that you're a little bitch you can't do. But if you give God that little bit, God can take something little and make something big out of it. You might be like me sometimes. You think, glory to God, my troubles are over. And about that time, bam! You know, like that fellow said, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel, but it was an oncoming train. <laughs> oh boy, the end! <laughs> it's finally over. Going, <laughs> and the world sees you and you keep hanging in there. And they think, that'll get him. That'll get him. Right there. That's why God lets you have trouble. See, if everything went cool for you all the time, they could figure us out. But when they see us having trouble just like they're having trouble, and we don't go get drunk, we don't blow our head off, we think about it, but we don't. We get our help from the Lord. We get our help from the Lord. They say there's something to it. There's something to it right there. Well, let me say it right quickly and I'll close. A Christian is one who sees the invisible. Now you say, now wait a minute. You can't see nothing invisible. You can if you're saved. Let me quote you a verse of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 4.18 We look not at the things which are seen. <laughs> what a verse. We don't look at things you can see. We look at things you can't see. Is it any wonder they think we're crazy? Here's a man coming in and says, What are you looking at? Oh, I'm not looking at anything you can see. <laughs> Paul said, We look not at things which are seen. What are you looking at? Nothing you can see. Well, listen, dummy, how can you look at something you can't see? Oh, I don't know. Christians can do the impossible. We can see the invisible. Well, you're crazy. Too. Oh, no, we're not crazy. Moses saw Abraham. They saw him who is invisible. Point at something. That's why they hate us. There's a lamb that is fairer than day. And by faith, we can see it afar. There's three heavens, you know. The first heaven you see by day where the birds fly. The second heaven you see by night, where the moon and the stars are. The third heaven you see by faith. Amen. And you know that it's there, land fairer than day. And you know what I said over yonder? We see through a glass darkly. Can you close your mind and see heaven? I can. Big old city. I like Clarence Larkin's drawings, but I imagine a little bit different than his. It looks like a Christmas tree. I mean, it might be like that. But I just picture it big and bright and four square them solid gold streets. And when you walk inside it, it's just the happiest you've ever been in your life. Can't even compare to how it's going to feel when you get there. 
Get you a new body, turn gainers down the streets of gold. Woo, 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 woo! Get around the throne. Fanny Crosby said, Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. And I tell you, the songwriter said, Therefore to sing forever of his saving grace. She said, Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come. And a parting at the river I recall. In the sweet bells of Eden they will sing my welcome home, but I long to see my Savior first of all. Amen. One of these days, little kid went downtown and he started looking at toys. He's standing there crying and looking at all the pretty toys at Christmas time. And somebody come along and said, Listen, friend, you want me to take you in there and buy one? Took him in there and bought him a toy. And he had a little teddy bear there. And he said, Now there's no glass between. Now there's no glass between. Now me and you, when we look up to God, there's a glass between. We see through it darkly. It's like smoke sunglasses. But one of these days, the Lord's going to pick us up, take us in the store, and give us anything we want, and we'll grab heaven and see it and say now there's no glass between. This is heaven. This is heaven. We can see the invisible. We enter. You say, oh, you're on a pipe dream, man. Hey, buddy, if we're dreaming, don't wake us up. It beats anything this world's got to offer. There ain't nothing in this world like the old time gospel, the old time way, knowing where you're going when you die. Being a, Hey, buddy, a Christian is one that can see the invisible. A Christian is one. These are words I made up to finish the message. They can do the undoable. They can go the unknowable. He is the unisable and was the unwasable, brother. He says the unsayable and makes the unmakeable and sings the unsingable and walks the unwalkable and hears the unhearable in the eyes of the world. And they hate us. But they ought to do what that old song says. Come go with me. To a land over yonder. It's made for the pure and the free. There's a place you can go. And it's ten million times brighter and prettier than anything Florida's got to offer. It'd make Disney World look like an outside toilet. You wait, son. You wait. What can the Lord do in a building program? Getting ready for His saints to get there. Hey, this old world here is pretty good looking in parts in the mountains and the beaches and stuff. And it's under a curse. What would God do if He really wanted to fix up a place? And you can go there with us this morning. Why don't you? Let's stand. Come on, preacher. Come on. Musicians, we're going to sing. Let you go. I believe there's somebody here this morning. God spoke to your heart. And if you don't know for a fact that you're going to heaven, why don't you get out of your seat right now and come on down here and let's get it settled. 253, 253. Sing 253, Lord, I'm coming home. 253. You want to go home with us? You come right now. Come on, boys. Come on, young man. Young lady. Come on, right now. Come on. Come on. God can help you this morning. God can do something for you. Amen. Come on. Come on, right now. Come on. Young people, let God do something for you this morning. Come on to Jesus. Come on, that's right. Come on, that's right. Amen. While she plays softly before we sing that next verse, I bet you there's somebody in here this morning. Your mama took you to church when you was little. You know as well as you're standing there what's right and what's wrong. But you've got out in the world and you've got a taste of what's out there. And that sin's got a hold on you. And that world and that flesh, that party and them drugs, that alcohol has got your life all tangled up. 
and you think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll quit one of these days, that thing's getting a hold on you more and more and more and more. And you better think with me this morning, this is your life. It's your soul you're fooling with. This ain't no game, man. What's, what's it profit a man if he gains the whole world? He loses his soul. What would happen to you if you died today? Well, you're going to one of these days. You know what you ought to do? You ought to do what you would do if you knew you was going to die today. I see some of you this morning look like God's really dealing with you. And this church loves you. And they want to help you. That's why they tell you the truth. They care about what happens to you. We love you and want to help you this morning. God's speaking to your heart. Why don't you get out of your seat? Young man, young lady, you, I can tell by the look on some of you's face, you're miserable. Why don't you just let go this morning and let God help you? Why don't we sing this next verse? Will you come? Come on, right now. Amen. That's right. Come on. Amen. Amen. Somebody else. Let God speak to you this morning. Come on to Jesus. Come on right now. Come on, boy. Let God help you this morning. Will you do it? again. I'm wonderful. Sing it out. Away from Let the Lord save you this morning. Will you come? Come on, teenager. Come on home. Come on home. The Lord wants to help you today. The Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you. Come on, friend. Come on. Come on. Now's your chance. Now's your chance, come on. Now's your chance, come on. Don't say no to God. Don't say no to the Lord. Don't say no to the Lord. Come on to Jesus. Come on, how we sing. How we sing. I don't usually do this. I don't extend invitations long. And I believe the Lord kind of moved in here a little bit a minute ago. There's something stirring right now. God wanting to do something for somebody else. And you just forget about it a little bit. We'll be through here in just a minute. You let God do something for you this morning. This is your day. He said, your time is always ready. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. We're going to sing one more verse. Then the pastor will come and close the Lord leads him. And I believe that there's some other people here. Maybe a grown man. Maybe a lady. Maybe just a young boy, girl. Maybe a visitor for the first time. Deep down in your heart, you know that God's there and wants to help you. We're going to sing the first verse just one more time. This is your change. Ready? I come on, come on.
Tara here a few months before we pull and I've undeceived people here. You fool around, fool around for it. Ain't nothing to fool with. You keep telling yourself, well, if I can just wait till I, if I can just wait, I'll wait. There's nothing coming but taxes, hospital beds, and graves. You understand? I don't care if you're 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50. What you've got coming is taxes, hospital beds, graves. That's what you're going to get down here. They shoot you up the rocket, they bury you up there. Now tax your rocket ship when you go up. <laughs> it taxes, hospital bed, graves. Now listen, you, you make sure you meet Jesus Christ and get to know him before your taxes go up, before the undertaker gets you, before you check down there, blue cross, double cross, and all that stuff here. You be prepared in Jesus Christ. We're going to sing one more stand. Are the altars open here? You come kneel and accept Christ. Get somebody to come with you. If you're worried about it, uh, ask somebody to come down with you. Some of you people here, you have people that love you, been praying for you, some of you 5, 10, 15 years. You know nothing yet. I'll tell you something. You're not going to do it. You're never going to do it. You just get your girdle your loins together like a man and say, okay, now. And then act. you got to act. Let's sing the last uh, stand. Then we're going to close. My soul is sick, my heart is sore. My soul is sick, my heart is sore. Come on, Lord, deal with you. Come on. This will be it. If you don't come, we're going to close here. If you're going to, you're going to do something, do it now. Coming home.